Costello. And I'm Leo Laporte. Thanks for joining us. Coming up in today's show, we're going to try to help make your Linux lives a little easier by uh, eliminating the password. Oh, that's helpful. Well, it's probably not a good idea, but we're going to show you how anyway because we have no taste. <laughs> okay, that explains uh. that short. Also, we're going to point you to a news group that will know that will uh, improve your gaming performance or your money back. Yes. Then later, Simidas has the best features on reading pa uh, on paper in an electronic form. On today's fresh gear. It's just what they told me to say. I don't know what it means. Before we introduce today's chat topic. Yes, let's check out the final results from the last poll. Our question was, what processor would you put in your UGM, we mean ultimate gaming Ooh. machine? Look at this. The Athlon wins. I think we, there must have been a, a note on some Athlon site and they've just all well, called Well, gee, in. there kind of was a note on an Athlon site. Saying, vote in that darn poll. So there you it was, go. Because it was neck and neck at the, by the end of the show. And I have a feeling that's probably how it would be in the real world. I would guess. Okay. Wish there were more G4 votes. Oh, yeah, but... Yeah. Big story of the day. Big story of the day. If you haven't noticed yet, give it to us, Leo. I want to hear what you have to say about this. Bill... <laughs> Come on, man. Made up. <laughs> Bill Gates uh, had a big press conference earlier, and we've been covering it like crazy on uh, ZDTV, and he announced in the conference that he was going to step aside as CEO of Microsoft, mm -hmm. become uh, remain as chairman of the board, and Steve Ballmer, who's been the president of Microsoft, was going to take the CEO position and gain a seat on the Microsoft board. Okay. So, you know, some people, I've heard people say, Bill Gates resigning. No, no, but, no. But he's not, because he's just, all he's doing, he's going to be the chairman, which is not a day-to-day -day role. You don't, mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not the guy who, who says, uh, signs the paychecks and says, fire this guy, and we've got to put a, a million dollars more on that kill Linux thing. It's, <laughs> he'll be the guy who does the visionary stuff. Didn't he announce that last year? A In year July ago, of 98. He yeah. said, I'm not going to be the day-to-day -day operations guy anymore. I'm going to be the visionary. Steve Ballmer's going to be. The exact same announcement. The truth is, and so I think if what? you watched the, the, the special silicon spin that was on just before the show, you probably heard them say, and I think this is absolutely right, for the last... Uh, since 1980, the last 15, 20 years almost, Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates have been running Microsoft. They continue to run Microsoft. It remains to be seen whether Bill Gates can keep his hands out of the day-to-day -day machinery. Even if he does, Ballmer is very much Bill Gates' boy. It doesn't mean a lot of changes. Now, there may be some speculation because of all these rumors that the Department of Justice is about to break, break up Microsoft, up. that maybe this was somehow a response. I don't see how it's a response in any way. Not at all. If you're Microsoft, let me th let's think. If you're Microsoft and you want to make the Department of Justice go away, okay. putting Steve Ballmer in charge is not going to do it. Steve Ballmer is a pit bull. Put, you, want to, you want to do that, you, get, you, know, you put Pee Wee Herman in charge. You get well, somebody outside of Microsoft to run the company, and you say, see, look, we took it seriously. We realize we've been doing it wrong. We're going to bring in somebody, I don't know, Carly Fiorina, somebody, somebody from that complete outside world, say, look, we're going to run this like a regular technology company. That's how you, that's how you appease the Department of Justice. Well, this are, isn't going to change Are people anything. just thinking they're removing the object of the DOJ's ire? But he's not. But the they, company not. Is. Uh, no. Unless, just, unless Bill Gates is such an egotist, he thinks this is all about him, but I don't think he does. I kind of don't. So, think so. honestly, and what I'm not does this mean? At all? Nothing. Not a lot. No. Nothing. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, Bill's got two kids. You know, maybe he wants some more time with his family. I wouldn't put it past him. I think it's a great thing. Well, he's made enough money, and I, I would say the man has worked hard enough. And if he wants yeah. to retire now, go for it. What is? Think about he's it. Still, he has what it. would be the best job in the technology industry? Not running day to day a corporation. It'd be being visionary sure. for a company with the clout and the money to do some amazing things. Would isn't that the job you would want? Of course. So Bill Gates just gave himself the best job in technology. And he said, Steve, you do the grunt work. And Steve Ballmer said, sure, man. That's what he said all along. You know, Steve was Gates' roommate at Harvard. Oh, my goodness. That's how he got in here, okay? Steve is not... Well, I'm not going to go any farther. Okay. Than that. But, I'm but just, I'm not surprised <laughs> you get in where the I'm least going. that this happened because of the announcements they, they made last year. So it's yeah. not news to me, really. It's not a big deal. It's not a big Nor deal. is it going to change the face of the uh, Microsoft Department of Justice or anything like that. No. Although, Meanwhile, so that's why we're not going to pick this as today's chat topic. No. We're, we're talking about something else. Nothing to vote on here, folks, but we have an interesting story. We do. Now, I don't know if y'all remember this case of a boy, right after the, the Columbine shooting happened, um, a boy who was lived in Florida and was friends with a girl student at Columbine, sent her an email and said, I'm going to come in and finish the job Horrible. that the boys had left undone, so don't come to school tomorrow. Horrible. And he warned her for this. Now, here's the best part. They're putting him on trial for this. His defense, the net made me do it. I was on the net. They're claiming internet intoxication <laughs> because he is doing what he feels that Jeremy Irons 
would do Somebody's intoxicated in that here. situation. He was <laughs> acting. Apparently, he's a big fan. Jeremy Irons is his favorite movie star. The star of what? What was Jeremy? Dead he was, Ringers? Dead Ringers, Lolita. Um, I mean, uh, 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 wasn't he... Uh, something of fortune. Reversal of fortune. The Rose... Anyway, I'm bad with listing. He's this kid's but, best, but best movie said, star. What would Jeremy Irons do? <laughs> it's like, what would Brian Boitano do? I don't so know. the question, did the net make you do it? <laughs> That's the question. Are you using this as your defense that the net made you do it? Is there such an internet intoxication? That is the most ridiculous. That's what you mean by do it. I mean. Well, it, I was on the net, man, and I was surfing and surfing, and I felt all worked up, and I had to do Cindy has whatever. something to say about this. From Finger Lakes, right. New York. Hey, Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Hi, this is Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Did so the net make you do it? I don't think so. I think it's time for people to take personal responsibility, Thank don't you? you? Cindy. Yes. Thank you. And even during the whole Columbine thing, it was kind of just distra uh, distressing to me in this horrible, horrible tragedy that all of a sudden, and I don't blame people for wanting to find a scapegoat, but they mm -hmm. were scapegoating video games and music and mm -hmm. the Internet. You know, I mean... Those are kids that would have focused in on anything and made anything dangerous that they yeah. liked. Yeah. That's, those are the kind of people... Is that, that, is that what you're saying here, Cindy? Absolutely. I've got eight kids, and I think it's just doing a disservice to the kid letting him cop out this way. You have eight kids. Wow. I know yeah. the Internet didn't make you do that. <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't have a computer then. <laughs> we know. <laughs> what do you think of the concept of Internet in intoxication? Like, what is that? Hey, it used to be said, the devil made me do it, and now it's, you know. Exactly. <laughs> Take a little responsibility. The devil made me do it, now the Internet yeah. made me do it. Cindy, Can we... I say hi to everybody in chat? Sure. I'm Cindy Wakeman. Oh, oh it's Cindy Wakeman. She's, we see her all the time. You're one of our moderators in one there. One of our hosts. Yeah, and I'm the assistant production coordinator. How do you too? have time with eight so I'm kids? I'm sitting here in the ultimate gaming room chatting with that's Everybody great. here. So. How do you find time, Cindy? To do? How old are your kids? 30 to 12. Oh, so most of them are out of the house. Yeah, there's only three at home. Uh. Megan, who helps Shannon. Oh, we know Megan. Oh, all right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And Serena and Jeffrey. Oh, that's great. Well, hi to them, too. Everybody. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. And thanks for the great job you do in our chat room. Oh, hey, we love it. All Thank right. you, Cindy, Take and care. all our chat hosts. Let's I love the Finger Lakes. Honor our chat hosts. We'll give her a finger salute to the Finger Lakes. All right. Thank you. Now, folks, you can see what all of us think and what Cindy thinks. We want to know, of course, what you think. Take the web poll, screensavers.com, and please always click on the talkback feature and just tell us, first of all, what Internet intoxication is, A. <laughs> if the Internet ever made you do something. Jeremy Irons made me do stuff. Yeah, Jeremy Irons made me watch these really twisted movies he was in. I don't know. Anyway, talk back. Do the thing. Give us a call on the telephone, 888-989-7879, or chat with us, chat.zdnet.com. The Screensavers Room is the place to be. Unless, of course, you have a net cam, then you click on the net cam cineplex, and you can be on television because you got Shannon and Brad in there, both in there. Oh, and Roger. Roger and Shannon. Hard at work. Hi, guys. And Roger made us the internet it. Make, oh, <laughs> the internet just made Shannon go. And, of course, earn yourself the fabulous, coveted screensaver's magnet as seen on our fridge to be seen on yours. Ah, oh, there's our dear Bill. Oh, isn't he sweet? Oh. He's so precious. Oh, thanks. Look, I didn't toss it in the viewer, so there you go. <laughs> well, folks. After the break, now that we've revealed the ultimate gaming machine, we're going to have a news group recommendation all about games when the screensavers continues. Let's do it again, Marcus. Here we go. <laughs> yes, it's time once again for News Group. This week's recommendation. <laughs> comp.sys.ibm.pc.gamesaction uh, Now that we build Zuggum, you want to find out what gamers think about Quake 3 uh, Arena versus Unreal Tournament? That's the place to go. There's also a list of the top games of 1999. How to install Quake 3 Demo on your Linux machine. Uh, it's all there. comp.sys.ibm.pc.games.action And that's a whole tree, actually. If you comp.sys.pc.ibm.games, you'll find a whole lot of other stuff, too. Okay. And you'll find links to this news group and all our news group recommendations. Where else? Thescreensavers.com. All right. Thanks, man. You're welcome. Hey, Chuck. How you doing, Chuck? Chuck I'm is joining us. Fine. Great, Chuck. Chuck is from Elkhart, Indiana on the ZDTV3 Comnet Cam Network. He's actually at a bowling alley, it looks like. 
No. <laughs> no? So, those are trophies. Oh. Oh, you're the bowling king, huh? What's your Better average, Chuck? being the bowling queen. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, I should show you my bowling shirt. It's Go get your bowling shirt. Okay, what's your average, Chuck? Uh, 210, 212. That's pretty good. And what's her average? Who's? The bowling queen. She doesn't even bowl. Oh. She doesn't bowl? I bowled like a 99 once. Okay, see? Look, it says it's Kate, Isn't like, champion yeah. bowler. Look. I think it said, what, 10 strikes in a row? Or mixed yours? league champion. I'm the mixed league champion. WIBC. This is all made up, by the way, I might add. Well, no, I earned this shirt, man. <laughs> of course you did. Hard I just, earned. I just watched Kingpin, which is a very funny movie, and at one point he says, what's your average? Oh, 265, 275. Mm -hmm. But he bowls 15 frames. Yeah. So it's a little different. A little. <laughs> so what can we do for you, Chuck? Well, I got a question. My, I've been getting emails and sending emails, and the date and time stamp on those things are really weird. Really? And people will say, you must have worked late last night. I got an email that said that you were there at 2.30 in the morning. Usually now, it, yeah, you'll funny. see it says GMT, or it says, uh, it says a GMT adjustment. So some of this, what ha you know, the process of how a date gets on an e uh, email is kind of interesting and fairly evol involved. You, of course, have an Internet service provider, right? Right. So what happens is you create an email in your program, doesn't matter what program, it time and dates it based on your local time and day. But then that goes out to the ISP and their send mail program, which then is munging the date to create the headers. And one of the things it often does is puts it in GMT, Greenwich Mean Time, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So it's a universal time, since your time is time zone dependent, isn't it? Right. So, in, you, in fact, if you look at the full headers, It'll either say GMT or it'll say GMT minus 8 or GMT minus 5. You're on the East Coast, GMT minus 5. Mm -hmm. um, those, those would be the things to look for in there. I, um, and then, uh, of course, when it gets to the receiving email package, um, their email package then interprets that date and time and should interpret it, uh, you, know, accord, you know, converting it back from GMT, but may not be doing that properly. Yeah, I got one from a uh, response from somebody yesterday. It was dated, or Monday, it was dated 1231 <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a Y2K. Nineteen sixty nine or twenty sixty nine. It's probably a Y two K problem. Yeah, yeah. Right. it may be that they're. You know, you should ask them. What's you know? Have have you checked the date and time on your computer? Because it's because remember the uh, the send mail. There's a number of dates, by the way, in it. There's the date it was sent, the date it was received by, you know, the ISP and so forth and mm -hmm. so on. You can trust that, presume the ISP is setting the date properly and so has the date and time set correctly. But they are taking some information from you about when you created that email. And that may be that that guy's system was messed up, you know. Okay. Yeah, it happens to me once in a while. I'll get dates from many, many years back. And I think it just has to do with how the guy sending it had his system configured. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm actually not clear on the, and I'd love to, and if anybody has a pointer to a document I can read, I'm not really clear on who gets what date, when they get set, and I, I, th you know, I think some of it will depend on how send mail is configured. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm actually really curious, and, and you've looked at the headers, right? Yeah, I've looked at them. I think there's a lot to, you know, that would be a great segment. We'll have to do sometime. What's in these headers, oh, and what does it all headers. mean? You know? All right. Well, especially when I get spam, I look at them and to see where they right. come from, and That's man, right. there's just a, a string of things, and it's, it's garbage to me. Right. And yeah. well, you'll notice dates and times all along because all of the servers that are passing it along also put a stamp on it. Yeah. So some yeah. server in there somewhere may be wrong, too. It could be. That's could possible. Be. Yeah. Hey, That's can a I great question. A, can I make a trade with one of you guys? Sure. If I can get an autographed picture, I'll send one of you my beanie cap. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to send us your cap. We'll be glad to send you an autographed picture. Just hang on the line, okay? Okay. Okay, John. <laughs> Thanks a lot. No Take need care. to pay for those. We'll get, well, well, all we ask is what they're worth. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely. I, get a, I get a magnet, too, because my wife will go crazy now. Of you get a, you get a magnet. You called on the Zini TV3 call that Cam Network. Yes, Therefore, I did. You get a mess. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. Thank you. See you guys. Thanks, Chuck. Bye. Bye. Have fun in 1969. <laughs> that was a good year for me. It was a good year. It was have in eighth a, grade. Have, pretend it's the summer of love, Chuck. Just go with it, man. Up next, more live calls and answers, of course, to your toughest competing questions. I was wearing this shirt. With the screensavers continue. You know what? Wow. <laughs>
is the place, the screensavers.com, the best place for more information about what's on this show. Have you, you know, remember that discussion we had about connecting optical cables to SPDIF? Man, did I get a lot of email, about 30 emails on it. If you want to know more about connecting mini disc players to the SPDIF connectors on the Sound Blaster, we've got the definitive guide, ladies and gentlemen, with links galore. It's all available, as always, at the screensavers.com. And thanks to all the third geeks who helped me. Oh. I we that was the day we announced we were going to use the Pentium three instead of the Athlon. Right. I thought we'd get millions of Athlon mails. We got a half dozen Athlon mails and over thirty telling me all the different ways we can use optical cables. So. I think we'll be doing more mini disc stuff on the screen like servers it. in the near future. People are into it. Yeah. All right. I love it. So uh, we have a call. Who do we have on the line from Reston, Louisiana? Hi, John. Hey, Kate. Hey, hey John. Say hi to my buddy here. No, you're not sad to me. I'm just, hey, will you? I'm just the fifth wheel. Go ahead, talk to Kate. I'll go over here and play a game. Oh, with you. oh fine. Just, just like, know. you get back over here. <laughs> what can we do for you, John? Well, I was wondering. I was wondering if the new Intel Celeron 533 megahertz can be overclocked. No. Well, isn't it already from a 450? <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, it's at 5, 533. The problem is, is, uh, is how are you going to overclock that, right? The uh, Intel Celeron chips are clock locked, which means you can't change the frequency. Mm -hmm. Here's, you know, remember how you overclock? There's two ways to overclock. A, a chip determines its speed based on the bus frequency mm -hmm. times uh, an internal multiplier. Right. So um, you can change the clock so multiplier. So a 550 Celeron would be running, let's say, on a, I mean, just to make the math easy, 100 megahertz bus we'll times 5.5, 5. 5. 5. Right? right? Now you've got a 533, so it's a 66 megahertz bus, and then it's clock locked in at whatever that is, uh, I don't know, 8. I don't know. So uh, let's say it's 7.5. I think that's actually what it is. So you can't change the 7.5. That's built into the chip, unfortunately. Intel's, in its wisdom, decided you not to overclock it. So when we overclock Celerons, there's really only one thing we can do, which is change the bus speed. Now, normally, what you're doing is you're setting it from 66 to 100, 100. a 50% increase. What happens when it's 50% increase on a 533 chip? It goes, oh, it goes to 800. And it won't work. It won't work. So okay. you maybe if you look at your motherboard and you're able to do lower increments than 100, something between 66 and 100, you might be able to get that to work. Hmm. But that introduces other problems because the AGP is based on a multiplier and the PCI is based on a multiplier on the bus speed. And if you change the bus speed to we too weird a uh, speed, you're going to get weirdness in, in the, uh, uh, the PCI speed is going to okay. be off or the AGP speed is going to be off. So they all understand up. 66 and 100, but may not necessarily right, understand. Right, right. And, you, you know, you can get away with, uh, you know, there's some slops. So, for instance, you can go from, like, 92 to 100, and it doesn't affect the uh, PCI bus. But if you go below 92, suddenly the PCI multiplier is all screwed up, and okay. the PCI bus actually goes faster, not slower, and it won't handle that. So you see what the problem is? Because they've clock locked the Celeron, we don't have the options we would have, and as a result, all we can do is set it for way too high a speed, which is why when they overclock Celerons, they stick with the 366 mm -hmm. up to the 433. I don't think people are overclocking anything more than the 433. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, okay. it's, just, it's, it's too high a chip speed already. Yeah. Now, don't be disappointed. A 533 is great. Now, it's interesting where we are seeing some really interesting overclock results is in the faster Pentium 3s in the Athlon. That people are over, if you go to overclockers, overclockers.org, you'll see some people who are actually getting the 733 Pentium 3 overclocked up to 850 and beyond. Really? Now, that's clock lock too, isn't it? Though? Yeah, I believe it is. So I'm not sure. Uh, I guess they're also changing the bus speed on that one. Huh. You know, you can go from 100 to 133 on these new boards. Oh, and that would so be a much smaller difference from 66 to 100. 33% percent so. increase. Yeah. So it's interesting to what, you know, I, I think this is fascinating. I have been... Uh, I had pretty good results, in fact, excellent results overclocking my Celerons at home, but they're 366s. Uh, and we haven't really tried. I think when we build your machine, because you know, you can't, you're spending your own money on your machine. This is true. So we're not going to put an 800 megahertz Athlon in there. We're probably going to do a 5 or 550. Cool. But we're going to take a look at overclocking it. All right. All right? Ooh, overclocking an Athlon? Yeah, oh, overclocks fine. very nice. That'll be fun. Cooling might be an issue. Yet. We'll take a look at that, too. Okay, well, I'll blow on it a lot. Thanks for the call. Uh, can I have an autograph? Of course oh, you can. Of course you can. Folks, you don't even have to ask us. Just ask when you get on the phone. They'll get your address. We'll be glad to send anybody an autograph. Yeah, Kate and Lee are going to say no. Yeah. No. No. No, no, no autograph no, for you. No autograph for you. On the ZDTV3 com Netcam Network from Louisville, Kentucky, one of our favorite towns, David's on the line. Hello, David. Hi, David. Hey, Kate. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? Oh, we're oh, doing hi. great. How are you? 
Is Lulu's uh, doing pretty good. Is Lulu's still there in Louisville? It is still there. Oh, it's a great restaurant. The oh, wall of corn. We ate, we <laughs> ate <laughs> at Lulu's. We had a great time. You know what I? Well, I can't tell you what I like because it's a family show. It's, it's the bourbon bar there was just oh wow. Oh really? <laughs> I like the um, soda pop and ice. Tea That's what I meant. What did I say? Myself. What can I do for you, David? Uh, I was just wondering. I just got another computer and. My friends come over all the time. We want to do some gaming, and we want to know the fastest way to hook them up together. Now, wait. Tell me again. What kind of machine do you have? I have an AMD 350, and there's another AMD 400. So they're all okay. Windows machines? All Windows 98. Now, they come over. Does that mean they bring their computer? No, I have two computers here, and they come oh. over, and we're going to play. Oh, That's I see. Fun. So you want, to, you want to just go between the two machines. New, so new, so local. new social event, by the way, that's going to be very, very hot. Is, uh, is, is, you know, in-home LAN network games. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that? I mean, that's so much fun. People do it in the office right now. And it's fun to play on the Internet, but it's, how much more fun is it when you're across the room from the person oh. and, you know, they go, oh, you got me. And it's so much more we fun. We used to do that at Computer Gaming World. We yeah. had an entire room dedicated to Quake. Oh, it's crazy. And you just open the door and hear, oh, what? I hate you. Oh. <laughs> oh. It's good room. What games. games do you play? Uh, Unreal, Quake 3. Awesome. Okay, so you want to hook them up fastest. Are they, they're nearby, aren't they? They're, the, the machines? They're in proximity? Yeah. So the easiest way to do it would be get a crossover cable and two mm -hmm. NICs. Okay. There you go. In fact, what I would do is I'd get the Etherlink 3 10 100 NICs so and run at 100. Megabits. There you right. go. Because then that's fast and it's fairly cheap. We're talking about 45 bucks for each card. Mm -hmm. And the crossover cable is about 15 So. We're, we're talking about maybe 110 bucks. Yeah, that's fine. Now, by the way, she explained crossover cable is switched. Your normal patch cable, of course, your data is going to go only one way through the patch cable. You actually mm -hmm. have to switch the grounds on one side of the cable in order to be able to send and receive back and forth. You're an old guy, David. You remember the null modem cable? Maybe not. No, uh, not really. You know how to make a pa <laughs> Do you know how to make one? If you were to take off the end of one patch cable and you're looking at all the strings sticking out on the end, and you switch one and three and two and six. And okay. then you clamp the end back on. That will make a crossover cable. But if that prospect weirds you out, just go buy one. They're cheap. Yeah, they're cheap. Yeah, I wouldn't make, You yeah. don't need to make your own. But just conceptually, what you're doing is you're switching the send and receive so that so when you send, they receive, receive. And when they send, you receive. Right. Uh, and, and the reason we say that, that avoids you having to go out and buy a hub. Of course, you know, so that would be the other way to do it is get a hub because a hub, in effect, does the crossover. Then you use two standard cables connected to a hub. Yeah, that's, that but why spend the extra, you know, 50 or 60 bucks for the hub? It doesn't, doesn't add anything. And it, a now, if you think you're going to get a third computer, then get a hub because crossover cable is only for two computers. Yeah. Does that two make sense? company with NICs and a crossover Makes cable. Makes pretty good sense. Yeah. And that way, you know, that's going to be cheaper than going out and getting one of these home networking systems yeah. and all that. You don't need all that. And frankly, it's going to be fastest uh, because you're direct connected one to the other. When are you guys coming to Louisville again, Leo? I can't wait. Oh. I don't know. We don't have uh, They haven't. We, uh, they told us uh, last year that we were going to do a bunch of appearances this year. I think they said as many as one a month, and they haven't told us yet what those are going to be. Nope. And I'm crossing my fingers that Louisville's on the list because we just. Oh, we always love when you're there. We, we had a go great to the Derby time. This year, so I, we may, well, that would be the first be... Uh, Saturday in May, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. hint, All right. Derby pie. Hint, here we hint, come. Oh, oh, <laughs> derby pie is a very dangerous, dangerous thing. What is it? It's like, be... a, it's like a pecan pie, With but chocolate chips. Chocolate chips. Oh yeah. Unbelievable. Two of my favorite things. Hey, thanks, David. Thanks. And I'll tell you what, when we come to Louisville, I'm coming over, and we're going to play a little Unreal Tournament, okay? <laughs> I'll be glad to have you over. All right, All right, deal. All right thanks, David. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Later. Don't start flipping, folks. Still to come on this very television program. Relax. Get to it when you want to get to it. Don't let a little... No, not Frankie Goes Hollywood. We're going we're gonna to show you how a little Linux password can keep you going. Also, our live caller Rama continues as we find solutions to your worst computer problems. Plus, an electronic newspaper that updates while you're reading. All that and more as Frankie Goes to Hollywood rolls on. Thank you so much for joining us. Today in the chat room, our question, did the net make you do it? We're talking about the uh, kid, this just reprehensible kid from Florida, who emailed a threat to one of the Columbine students after the Columbine um, high school shootings and was caught 
and is uh, serving a trial right now, is on trial right now, and his lawyer said, well, what our defense is going to be, the net made him do it. He was, uh, he, it was an innocent thing. He was just intoxicated by the power of the Internet and wanted to see what would happen. Right. He also wanted to see what Jeremy Irons would do in that situation. That's I was, very confusing. I was really me. only acting. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I guess Jeremy Irons has some kind of weird vermal website with <laughs> really scary stuff in it. Maybe that's it. Here's the point. Can you take responsibility? Can you actually blame your, blame your computer for your behavior? Can you behavior? blame the Internet for anything? You cannot Nothing. blame the computer for your behavior. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. As you are responsible for your own behavior. We agree. We agree. Well, you can see what Except we Except for that little thing that that wasn't mine. That wasn't your fault. No, devil made you do that. Take our web poll at screensavers.com. And while you're there, of course, click on the talk back feature. Tell us how you really feel. Tell us if the Internet ever made you do anything. <laughs> you can chat. All made the, me. Chat with, it, chat with us at chat.zdnet.com. Uh, if your computer's talking to you, it it's might be sign. cause for concern. It's a bad sign. Yes. Pete joins us on the ZDTV3Com Netcam Network from Atlanta, Georgia. Hello, Pete. Hello, Pete. Hey, how are you guys doing? We're doing great. Good. What you doing? Um, I'm doing all right. I Good. just got a uh, cable modem. I can oh. tell. It's a darn fine picture. Actually, I'm talking on the net cam through a 56K modem. Oh, really? You're what kidding I'm me. What I'm trying to do here, I'm on the chat on the cable modem right now. Right. I'm trying to use a Linux box. I have a 15-port hub, a Linux box, uh, two extra NICs in the Linux box, a NIC in each of my other three computers. Yep. I'm trying to serve... The other three computers would be one cable modem connection. Is that you, possible? Yeah, it's very easy to do. You want to make the Linux box be a proxy server for the rest of the network. Right. It's actually a great idea for a lot of reasons. Not only do you get to share your Internet access across the whole network, but that Linux box is going to act as a firewall protecting the rest of the computers from the Internet so that people can't get into your computer system. Yeah, the only IP address will actually go out on the network is the one coming from yeah. the Linux box. Now, it's really it's a very simple thing to do. You're merely going to go in there and modify one of the... RC files, the run command files, you'll find them in the rc.d directory, and you're going to add a couple of lines running the IP chains program. Now, what's IP chains? IP chains is a program that does exactly this. It's sometimes called uh, IP masquerading. Okay. In the outside world, it's known as NAT, Network Address Translation. And what happens is all of the requests for Internet access from the other computers are taken by your Linux box and translated, sent out to the real world, when the data comes back, it sends it up to the appropriate requesting computer. Now, showing you, we've actually done this on the air, believe it or not. I mean, it's one of the geekiest things we've ever done. And in fact, that box that we set up, we set up for our uh, show producer, Ken Marcus, is still running at his house, is still serving. Ken, and it, for the, except for the times that you've shut it down, Ken, has it ever shut down on its, on its own or crashed or anything? It's very reliable. Yeah, so. You can use a cheap old computer, 486, to do this. In fact, you don't even need a hard drive in the computer. It's, there, there are Linux distributions that fit on a floppy. Quinix. <laughs> actually, well, I wouldn't use Quinix for this. There's actually a, a, a Linux router project, LRP, oh, yeah, yeah. that you put a Linux on a floppy. Well, let me show you where you can find the specific instructions, because what we did is we, we, when we did this, we, I wrote an article, and the article is on the website. So I'll show you how to find that. It's at thescreensavers.com, and you want to go to our Linux hub. We've created a hub for all of our Linux content. Go to the archive, which is on the left there, and you'll see a, a link somewhere for the Linux hub. Maybe it's all the way down no, to the bottom. You have to hit the all Linux the way first. down to the bottom. I found it just a second no, ago. No, but you hit the Linux archive first. You have to hit the SuperGuide first. Is it in where? SuperGuide? Right oh, Super darn it. It's right there. Darling. Darn it. I was looking for that button. Yeah. I anyway, know. scroll down, set up a Linux proxy server, and uh, there's a video of how we did it. There's a discussion of what you do, it, and, and actually, there's a link to an article outside our site from WebMonkey. That's the, I hope it's still online. Let me just check. Yeah. yeah good. This guy did. Todd Trapman deserves a lot of credit. He did a great job of writing up how to do IP masquerade, and it's on the WebMonkey site. So we've got all the links there that you, you would want to do this. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of detailed text and stuff to enter. I'm not going to be able to tell you on the air, but it's, it's actually really only about four or five lines. You'll, you'll put in, uh, it's interesting, you know, there are modules for de the kinds of communications you want. IRC, the, I mean, by default it does web, and I think FTP, but if you want to add IRC uh, and gaming, you have to put in extra modules. All that's discussed in our article. And uh, finally, uh, uh, we found that it works with some things we didn't expect it to work, like VPN. Oh, it did. Ken's it did. using VPN through that. it. It works just fine. So there's not many things you can't do. This really works great. And I'll tell you what, it, it, there's no slowdown. It's transparent, and it's re reliable as heck. The thing never crashes. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, it's All a right, good Pete. project for you, Pete. And Look, it's Pete's got rabbit ears. 
Hey, who's that? Hey, that's my little brother behind me. I thought hey. it was a little brother. One. Yeah. Looks like a Quit little brother. It. Now, one get, thing. Get him in here. To get his face on TV. Come on. Tell him yeah, to leave in. Hey, come, come on, on Brian. Brian. He gets some credit, See, too. Oh, it's, I call him Mini Me. Is, is, is a mini <laughs> he does look like he a Mini you. you. Look, he looks just like him. Is he, is he going to be one of the one of the uh, computers on the net? Uh, yeah, most likely. He's got a good brother to do that. Pete and repeat, we call him. Yes. <laughs> By the way, do read the security uh, issues on here uh, and so forth, so you know what you're getting into. The Linux security guy and stuff. So you have to make sure you configure your security right, or it's worse than no, no security at all. Okay? Actually, Roger Chang wrote that article. Did a great job. Lots of good information in there. Okay, Pete. All right. Well, thanks for your help. Our pleasure. Hey, Pete. Will yep. you and uh, Brian repeat there? Take us to break. <laughs> oh, sure. No all problem. Right. Thank you, sir. All right, thanks, King Leo. Credit cards with updating displays and billboards with changing animation. It's all coming up. The screensavers continue. Oh, all right. Right. you got a career ahead of you, Pete. Well that done, was great. Sir. All right. This is Pete signing off. Toy, the computer this week. What are your high tech New Year's resolutions? Don't have any? Well, take the quiz and find out what all the other geeks are wishing for. All at thestreamsavers.com. And congratulations to Dwayne, to Dwayne from uh, Winchester, Virginia, the hey, winner of yesterday's Super Geek quiz. He got a t shirt, or what's another name for a cap? A hat. Uh, a cap. A sliver. A. a, 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 a I just. No, Somebody, a sliver help me, is an help old me. Card. Somebody, uh, another name for a cap. A, a chapeau. Chapeau. There we go. All right. All you have to do? Fill out the form after you've taken the quiz That's every right. day, a new chance to win. And now, as Head promised, gear. here's Sumi Das with a report about electronic paper on today's, yeah, man, fresh gear. <laughs> While newspapers, magazines, and books may seem fairly low-tech to most of us, they are technologies that work. After all, printed paper is high-resolution, inexpensive, and flexible. It's also recyclable, which is good for the environment. However, there is one thing you still can't do with paper. Once it's printed, that's it. You can't make any changes. Several research facilities have developed new technology that reproduces the best features of paper in an electronic format, but also adds rewritability. Ironically, electronic paper is actually made up of a thin layer of plastic. The key to this new technology is tiny two-tone particles contained in separate oil-filled compartments. By applying a voltage pattern consisting of electrical charges, the particles rotate and create images or text. A different voltage pattern erases old images and creates new ones. Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center, or PARC, calls its electronic paper display technology Gyrocon. The system uses a wand device to essentially serve as the printer by providing an electrical charge for the display sheet. Simply draw or wave the wand over the Gyrocon sheet and the image appears. The possibilities for Xerox's electronic paper technology are endless. Imagine, for instance, an electronic paper that automatically updates your stories, even as you're reading it. Other potential applications include storing an entire library collection in a single book, or... You could imagine a credit card with a small display on it, or you could imagine an entire billboard flashing messages in, in, in animations. The uh, limitation on applications will just be uh, our imagination. MIT's Media Lab also has an electronic paper project in the works. However, unlike the others, its vision remains true to the paper format and may one day print circuits and display elements onto normal paper. That may help convert some technophobes who don't want to give up the experience of curling up with a well-thumbed novel. These concepts are at least a few years from reaching the marketplace, but consumers can already catch glimpses of the technology in action. Electronic paper displays are already appearing in the form of advertising signs in retail stores across the nation. Who knows, we may be reading from electronic newspapers even sooner than we think. You can catch a new fresh gear every Friday afternoon at 1.30, 12.30 Central right here. On got an intriguing email. I don't know if we've still. I don't know if we've got the exact answer, but we're going to give it a shot. Okay. Wayne from Marcusan, Wisconsin, wrote, "I have an old 40, uh, 46 running Red Hat Linux 6. It's not online. Has only one user. 
I would like to skip the normal logon process and boot directly to KDE without needing to enter a password. Very interesting. We'll show you how to disable the Linux password. The Stream Savers continues. Wisconsin. I'm an old 46. It's running Linux. Don't want the password, but I still want to go uh, right to my GUI, which okay. is what KDE is. So, first of all, he said an important thing. He's not online. If you were online, I would strongly recommend against turning off password protection in Linux or any server-style operating system because mm -hmm. without a password, you're very susceptible to getting broken into. Sure. And more, it's not just you that I'm worried about. Once people get into your system, they can use your system as a launching pad for other exploits on the net, and you're the one who looks like is doing it, right? That's so ugly. You don't want the FBI knocking on your door. So it's a good idea to have not only passwords but secure passwords. Remember, a, a bad password is as bad as no password. Yeah. So I'm gonna, we, we're going to show you. Now, this is an interesting question because Linux is definitely not designed not to have a password. It's a multi-user operating system. And in order to turn off the passwords, you kind of have to mess with the system a little bit in ways that it's really not intended. Okay. So uh, it's not just a simple issue like in Windows of making a blank password no, and being done with it. No, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately not. Truthfully, I would recommend use a password. It just takes a few seconds. There are, by having a password, you have your own directory mm -hmm. where all your settings are kept. I mean, and it's for security reasons, for safety, uh, for your own safety so you don't accidentally delete somebody else's files. It's good to have a password. Okay. The password uh, can be modified, though. And there's a couple of ways. And, and, and actually, you know, I did a lot of searching for this. And by the way, when you ask about this on the net, you're going to get flamed. I read more flame mail from people uh, responding to the question, how do I disable the password, than I read answers to the question. Why? Why do people get so head well, up about that? Well, people just don't like the idea of not having that security. Okay. Here's where you want to go. In your ETC, your et cetera folder, there's a, there is a file called init tab. And actually, we've opened that file right here. This is, this is the file that gets, that runs before anything else happens, including your password. Okay. Okay. Now, there is a single user mode in Linux, okay, that ah. requires no password. And all you have to do to en enable that is go down here to the ID. Let's get that tight shot again so that I can uh, oh. show you. ID 5, colon 5, right at the top there. 5 is what says boot into X11. X11. What we're going to do is change that to 1. Boot that That's into it. Single? That's it? That's it. There's a problem with this. What? You save it and then reboot. When you do that, you're going to reboot the machine. It won't ask for a password. I'll get dumped to a shell prompt. Nothing. No network services are available. And X doesn't run, at least on my system. And I think, and I haven't played with it enough because I don't want to go too much farther down this path on my own system. I think that's because none of the initialization scripts are now getting run. So if you do, what, if you do this, what you're going to have to do is do a little script hacking with the run commands and make sure that they get run. And then I believe they'll turn on the services like Internet services okay. and, X, and X window and stuff like that. Those services will then be turned on. And then so you could make a script that does all that and that says start X, puts you in X window, and you're done. And you'll have, you'll have actually root access to the system. Okay. When you do that, when you're in single user mode like that, mm -hmm. you have root access you're to the system. You're just the root. Now, the single user mode is used more commonly for when you mess up stuff. Like, let's say you're the root and you forget the password. When you hit the Lilo prompt, you type Linux 1 or Linux single. Mm -hmm. You're in single user mode. You can then change the password, re-log in, you're and everything normal. Root. You're automatically root without a password. You might say, well, gee, isn't that a big hole in the Linux security model? Well, it is, except that you have to have physical access to the computer in order to do that. Same thing here. Now, you have, you have mangled the Linux security model when you put it in the init tab because this runs all the time. So anybody who runs your computer or is in your computer can get there without a password, uh, regardless of physical access to the computer. You're making this the default, say, Linux single. Uh -huh. So I wouldn't recommend it for anybody. Uh, but that's what we've done by changing that five to a one. Now, there are a lot of script changes, and what we've done is we put a link on the website to John Gatewood Ham's article in the Linux Gazette. He talks about how to run in single mode all the time, and he has a list of some of the uh, changes to the run command scripts you're going to have to make. Um, and it's a little complicated, and I kind of left it that way on purpose, because if you do this, I want you to be somebody who knows what you're doing. Oh, okay. That, that's, <laughs> okay? That's why. And it really, sure. truthfully, you probably shouldn't be using Linux if you, don't, if you don't want a password. Go back to Windows. You don't 
You don't need a password. Uh, there's the Linux Gazette, by the way. Oh, it's a great, a great website and a great magazine. Highly recommended. It's, it's the online site of the Linux Journal, which I love. All okay. Right. So, Patrick joins us on the phone from Bath, Maine. Thanks for joining us, Patrick. Hello. Hi, Patrick. Hi. What's up? Uh, hi. 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 Um, hi, Patrick. Hi. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> okay, um, go. Two minutes for you, guy. Okay. I was wondering um, when the release date for Windows 2000 was going to be. Next month. Yes. Oh, wow. And people have just started to get the final, and the people that I know it's who have it. It's gone to manufacturing. Love it. I love, I've been using RC2, the release candidate 2, which is an earlier beta for about three months. No problem. No. Nope. Fabulous operating system. Uh, like Linux, it's solid, doesn't crash. When a program crashes, it crashes, of course. You can't stop programs from crashing, but it doesn't mess up the rest of the system. You don't have the shutdown problems you have with the Windows 98. Drawbacks. It's huge. 40 million lines of code. Oh, wow. You really need 128 megs to run it at a decent speed. Okay, 128 megs of RAM, okay? Uh, it really wants a fast processor. I'm running it on my dual Celeron 550s with 128 megs of RAM. It screams. It's great. It's multi-processor. Runs most applications, including Quake 3 and Arena, in multi-processor mode. Mm -hmm. it, uh, does some, some games don't run. Some older programs won't run. Some hardware compatibility issues? I haven't found one yet. Works with okay. all. It's basically they've done a good job of taking the Windows model of compatibility and put it on a reliable operating system. It's what Windows ought to have been in the in the first place. I like it. It's going to be expensive, 216 bucks, 219 bucks for the upgrade, and it's going to take a lot of hardware. But I bet you, you watch, Microsoft saying Windows 2000, which is a successor to NT, is only going to be for businesses. That's where they're pitching it. I suspect oh, no. a lot of users, a lot of high-end users are going to want it because of the reliability. And because it runs DirectX 7, it runs all your games, it supports USB, finally. Uh, it does all the things that you really want Windows to do. I, I'm very happy with it. It's the whole reason people use NT at home. If you're someone who would use NT at home, you'd be perfectly oh, happy with No Windows question at all. But I think even some Win98 users are going to use it. And my, my position, I've said this all along, what is the number one ease of use issue from beginner to expert is not crashing. Please don't. The computer crash. that crashes is not easy to use. So if you find an operating system, it, maybe it's other ways it's hard, and I don't think it's that much harder. But if it doesn't crash, that makes it a lot better for beginners or experts. And I think that this is going to be an operating system. I think Microsoft should be very proud of this operating system, believe it or not. I really think they've done a good job. This is the operating system we've been waiting for, and I think a lot of people are going to adopt it, more than uh, Microsoft expects. All right. I think okay. they'll scale it down a little bit for consumers. Oh, well, that's coming, too. Yeah. We're going to show you, by the way, when it comes out in February, we'll, we'll be doing a lot of Windows 2000 coverage. And I think Patrick's coming in on uh, Friday to do some Windows uh, 2000 stuff oh, really? for us, too. Yeah. Oh, good. Then we can play with it some. Yep. All right. Speaking of play, you, too, can be part of all this fun and frolic. Oh, yes, but how, you say? Record and send us a video email instructions. Is this that was good. And your scripts are waiting at the screensavers.com. Now watch it. Click on Interact to find out more. And now, so here's Andrew. Just session. take a look at it. Oh. Welcome back to the Screen Savers. Take a peek up there on your screen and you'll say that so far 90% of you are taking responsibility for your own behavior. Thank you very much. You've got 24 hours to do so at the Screen Savers. I'm worried about the 10%. Oh, they're kidding. They're I hope kidding. you guys clicked Talk Back and told us why you clicked Yes there. Gary Glitter. Oh, oh. yes. Tux. 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 <laughs> All the way, Tux. Wouldn't that be great if Bill Gates came on to the press conference? I'd just like to announce that the new president of Microsoft is Tux the Penguin. <laughs> Bill, uh, I'm sorry, Gary Glitter. He'll right? be here all week. The correct Glitter? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not right. <laughs> the correct way to name Uggum is by version related to its processor and any upgrades on its peripherals. For example, the original Uggum 1.0 had the P2 333. Uggum 1.1 was the updated P2 450. When the TNT car was added, it was Uggum 1.2. When the Sony Plasmatron was added, it was 1.3. Okay. Okay, thank you. Rusty writes us and is from Springfield. Uh, he says that, could you please, this is for you too, dude. Yes. Can you please put out a message to the manufacturers of flight sticks to make one for left handed people? I'm a lefty. Lefties, lefties, lefties. He said, I'd rather use the separate throttle joystick combo, but as you can tell, they only work for right handed people. Now, can you switch things on that? Can you reverse it at all? Can you Sorry, do anything? Sorry, I got distracted. I just got fragged in Quake 3 over there. Well, that's because you're not staying in there. I hate it when that happens. Yeah, it's easy to get There's grabbed. ways. All us lefties are used to kind of doing everything kind of 
backwards and funny because there's that's the way it is. These mice, look at these mice. There, there's only no, one mouse I know of that is designed for a lefty. Yep. So that's why, folks, if Here's you a, notice, we're always switching the mice. Now right. I mean, notice who's been playing. It's on the left-hand side. Yeah. In part two of Ugamok 2, asks Phenom, you or said to get the DVD raw before it was region locked. What is region locked and why do you... Uh,